You are listening to a free audio recording of You Made the Best Decision You Could with the Information You Had, an essay that is part of my anthology titled For Your Consideration. If you enjoy this work and wish to read more pieces like it, then please consider supporting me by purchasing the ebook or paperback version available at the links below, where you will have access to almost two dozen more essays including What Makes Societies Claps, How People Grow Wise to Begin With, and others in this soon-to-be world-famous collection. If you cannot purchase my anthology, then follow the link to my channel where you will find other free readings, and be sure to leave a like and review. Thank you. Now, without further ado, you made the best decision you could with the information you had. Some many years ago, I was working with my father at the bar he managed. My duty was as a workhorse. For meager pay, I would ferry boxes upon boxes upon kegs of beer and liquor between the bar itself and the shop front, as well as performing any other odd jobs from clearing trash to salting sidewalks to cleaning rooms. I was very good at it. I wanted to impress my father, and so worked as diligently as I could, helping where I was asked and advising where it was needed, and it was very, very important for me to be correct. All the time. Still is. So prideful am I. So much so that at times it felt as if, if I made the wrong choice, if I were judged and labeled because of it, and if people turned to me and laughed at my foolishness, the entire ground would swallow me up, and I would be unable to breathe. Sometimes it still feels that way. In the midst of these anxieties, and in my desperation to prove my work ethic and constitution, I worked long and hard, often staying after hours with only a few other workers to ensure everything was done to satisfaction. During one of these times, The slat door at the rear end of the cooler opened, and delivery men entered to exchange the now empty kegs for full ones, and as I helped them load and unload, one of the workers picked up a keg and noted that it was only half empty, and asked me, for there was no one else, what I wanted them to do with it, to take it with them, or leave it there. I thought for a moment, and knowing absolutely nothing about the process of refilling or exchanging said kegs, nor of their billing, I figured that they likely wouldn't refund or scrub a half-empty keg, and that my father should get his money's worth, and so I told them to leave it. The rest of the night passed without incident, and I walked home satisfied in my decision. The next morning, in helping my father restock the alcohol, he lifted that same keg and asked me why this one was half-empty. I explained to him the situation and how I told them to leave it, and he clicked his tongue as he muttered, Damn, I wish they had taken it. And I instantly deflated. I was apologetic, and it hurt me more than it should have to know that I had made the wrong decision, that between the options before me I had chosen the more foolish, the more thoughtless, the more stupid, which meant I must be foolish, and thoughtless, and stupid. I felt as if all my wrong decisions were more than just an inconvenience or an unsatisfactory conclusion, and that they were, instead, a personal slight against my being. A stain, that they made me ever so slightly more unworthy of something, anything, than I had been the day before. Sometimes when I cannot sleep, I still feel that way. But, in the middle of my inane ramblings, much like how I'm going on now, he stopped me, mid apology, and told me something. He told me, You didn't make a bad decision. You made the best decision you could with the information you had. Then I worked my shift and went home enjoying the walk and the time it gave me to think. I do not believe he realized the gravity of what he said. 
I think to him it may have been a one-off, some fortune cookie wisdom to dispense when someone may be feeling insecure over their choices. Maybe he read it in a book somewhere, or misremembered someone telling him something similar in his youth. I doubt he even remembers that moment, and how it changed my life or how I view it. You made the best decision you could with the information you had. I spent the next seven years thinking about that, quizzing myself on it, seeing how well it held up to scrutiny, playing with it, thinking it over and seeing the shapes it could take as if it were clay, and when it hardened and set too much for my liking, I would break it back down to its components and begin anew to see what else it could apply to. I've told it to countless people when they were going through hard times, uncertain over their decisions, what the future may hold, or especially when the guilt of failure racked them. When someone made a call that had irreversible consequences economic hardships, personal loss, the death of a loved one. Something I learned very quickly was that people have a tendency to pass judgment in retrospect, with all the context and conflicting perspectives that different viewpoints provide, context and viewpoints that those making the decision may not have been privy to. We judge things like intellect and wisdom by its results, rather than the forethought that went into those decisions in the first place, and we are very eager to make those judgment calls in a wide brushstroke over the individual and all events they faced, perhaps because it is easier than picking it apart piece by piece. But people are more than the culmination of their choices, I think, and a man's taste is not defined by meals he has eaten in poverty. But, perhaps I'm mistaken. It is true that smart people tend to make smart decisions and stupid people tend to make stupid ones, and so perhaps it is completely fair to judge based on results. Perhaps it is completely fair to strip Publius Quinstilius Varus of all honors and dignities for his greatest failing, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, and move on as if the judgment alone carries the full weight of truth. So let us judge him once more here and see what verdict is given. Varus, as I will now be referring to him, was a Roman general and politician living under the reign of Emperor Augustus I, who ruled from 27 BC to 14 AD. For a total of four years, Varus governed the Roman province of Africa, then Syria, where he was known for his harsh and decisive rule, before returning to Antioch where he was appointed governor of the newly established province of Germania. As he was preparing to march to his winter headquarters with his three legions, Varus was told by Arminius, who was a German prince and a hostage to Rome in order to secure loyalty, that there were revolts being sprung in the west, and that he ought to go put them down. Varus agreed, waving off warnings not to trust Arminius, and rushed his troops to squash the rebellion. Unbeknownst to Varus, there was no rebellion. Arminius had been plotting against him for some time, uniting tribes to his banner with the intention to annihilate this Roman army. Three separate times the Roman army had been ambushed as they went further west, and yet they pushed on further and further until they arrived at Teutoburg Forest, and as they nervously trekked through the thick brush of the dark woods, they were ambushed for the last time. Stones and spears were flung from behind the trees in volleys so thick that the Romans had to press all their muscle behind their shields for fear of having their skull crushed, and the clamor and clanging of stone against metal was so fierce that they could not hear the steps of the Gallic warriors pouring out from the dark until they were already completely overrun by the furious defenders. It was a slaughter. In the midst of battle, Varus, seeing the blood and gore, hearing the cries of agony in his own tongue, and seeing his men desperately trying to flee for their lives, only to be cut down, knew that all was lost, and took his own life by falling on his sword, as was the Roman custom. Twenty thousand men were lost in this expedition including five thousand of them being hosted by these same feigned allies who had been killed in silent raids while they slept. 
The news of this titanic loss of men would cause the normally level-headed and wise Emperor Augustus to be driven to near madness, ripping at his hair and bashing his head against the walls of his palace as he cried, Quinstilius Varus, give me back my legions! And the serial numbers of the battalions slain would never again appear in the Roman military, thought to be an ill omen and bad luck. Varus's political legacy in Rome was completely washed away, along with the aspirations of his son, now doomed. All those who had recommended Varus, or otherwise had positive associations with him, were put under severe scrutiny, some losing everything, and others sacrificing scapegoats just to stay afloat, and monuments bearing Varus's face had it scrubbed away. This defeat had crushed any dreams of spreading the empire further into Germania, and Varus's very name became associated with catastrophic failure. This, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, is recorded as one of the worst Roman defeats ever suffered, and the whole of the blame rests squarely upon Publius Quinctilius Varus because he was a catastrophic failure. And it is so easy to see why. It is so easy to blame him for being so eager to crush a revolt that it can be easy to forget that he was given a direct order from his emperor to expand Roman influence and consolidate power, and that he may have seen this as an opportunity to do just that, and that not doing so would be against the will of the emperor. Not to mention that if he allowed a revolt to simmer over the many months of winter, it could become yet another costly war. It is so easy to blame him for a lack of preparation and the underestimating of his foe that it can be easy to forget that nigh everyone, from all generals who had surveyed the area right up to high political figures in the capital of Rome, had declared that Germania had been successfully pacified and was fully committed to Roman rule. It is so easy to blame him for trusting the betraying Arminius that it can be easy to forget that Arminius, for most of his life, had been an astute Roman citizen and even a cavalry auxiliary in the military. In fact, he served with distinction during the Great Illyrian Revolt and had been Romanized to the point where many Gallic chieftains initially distrusted him and that both the faction he was born from and his own brother were completely loyal to Rome, fighting against him in the coming wars. It is so easy to blame him for dismissing the warnings about Arminius's treachery that it can be easy to forget that Segestes, the man who bade this warning, held a grudge against Arminius and had motive to lie, and whose reputation was likely not known to Varus, who would have thought of himself as protecting and standing up for one who had up to this point, served loyally and diligently, with no cause for suspicion. It is so easy to blame him for pressing on, despite the frequent ambushes he faced, that it can be easy to forget that not only was he being called to crush a rebellion, but to assist newly formed allies of Rome, allies who may be depending upon them that Roman honor insist he help them, no matter the cost, and that if he had left and turned around, he could have easily been leaving them to die. It is so easy to blame him for not sending out a damn scouting party at the very least, and for rushing so headlong into shoddy terrain rather than planning covert strikes or counterattacks, that it can be easy to forget that such measures weren't commonly taken by Romans who preferred open battle and whose tactics generally leaned toward defense and attrition, who considered such scheming military maneuvers as cowardly and unbefitting of Roman dignity. It can be so easy to blame him indeed. But now I ask you this. Suppose Arminius was loyal and not lying. Suppose a rebellion really was occurring. Suppose his allies truly needed his aid and that without them, Roman trust, influence, trade, and all that was so needed to consolidate a new province would fall. Suppose then that he did not go. Suppose what we would be saying about him now 
and how he had let all of Rome down. Suppose things had just been a little bit different. Would he not be making the right decision to go? And suddenly it is not so easy to tell. Poor Varus. Poor, stupid, worthless Varus, whose greatest misfortune was that his post was not taken by another. Another who was nigh certain to have made the exact same decisions he had. So much were they a product of their time, their training, their culture, their experiences. It can be so easy to place blame and cast judgment in retrospect for the exact same reason that it is so easy to cast it upon our past selves, as if they were just us, with all the knowledge we had now, as if they had placed all bets upon red when the wheel came up black, as if they should have known, they should have known, you should have known. But how could you? There is a comic artist somewhere on the internet who goes by the handle Shen. I don't much read funny pages, and so these kind of comics never appeal to me, but there is one of his I saw that did very much. And much like the words of my father, I do not know if he understood the full weight of what he was saying when he first made the comic for the punchline. In the comic, which I have always called that dice roll comic when talking about it with others, he talks about how people often equate a bad outcome to a bad decision, but that this isn't necessarily true. Sometimes you can put a lot of forethought and planning behind a decision and still be tossed onto the rocks by a storm appearing out of nowhere. He demonstrates this by referring to a gamble, a roll of the die, that you roll a single die and you can bet that it will either land on the face of the one, three, four, five, or six, or you can bet that it will land on two, and two alone, and that, obviously, all things being equal, it is sensible to take the first option. You have a higher likelihood of winning. It is the sensible option. It is so sensible that most people I have asked have presumed that it's some type of trick, that they would get more betting on the two, or that it was a loaded die. But there is no trick question. There is no secret. There is no extra glory or reward for taking the extra risk. It is objectively the smart decision, the wise decision, the right decision to take the first choice, and in a life so full of variables, so full of self-doubt and hidden context, it can feel odd to talk of anything in such certainty that it is the right choice to take the first option. It is the right choice. Of course it is. It always was. But it can still land on two can't it? Just because the outcome was unfavorable doesn't mean the decision was flawed. That's the text that appears right before the punchline. There's something strange in that. Like, when I read it, I lose a part of myself. Like there is some light drifting off into a void that can neither be mastered or shaped. A void of luck, chance, fortune, and misfortune. There's another quote just like it that gives me the same feeling when Jean-Luc Picard says, it is possible to make no mistakes and still lose. That is not weakness, that is life. Poor Varus. Poor, foolish, naive Varus, whose greatest misfortune was being born into a world where such a thing is so utterly and resoundingly true. And such poor, foolish we who can do nothing but sit and look back and think on how stupid we all were for being blown in the wind of fate's whimsy. How stupid we all are for not knowing, for acting and deciding and declaring without ever knowing the ending before it has come, as if we ought to, as if we should have, as if we could have read all the way to the end as if it were just spoilers in your favorite book, and we just chose not to. 
what a misfortune it is to be born to such a world where you could make that bet and lose and know that a thousand years into the future people will still be looking back at you and laughing and talking about how you so clearly should have known the die would land on two. That it is your personal failing that you did not. That you should have just been blessed with precognition. That you should have just been anyone but who you are. That maybe you should have just thought a little bit harder before you chose to be born. What cold reasoning. What Machiavellian reasoning. The same Machiavelli who is nigh sanctified in his wisdom and the art of statecraft and politics, whose very name is associated with cunning and guile. The same Machiavelli who, in his life, endured more defeats than he ever tasted victory, whose legacy was not even read by those in his time. The same Machiavelli who seemed so clearly a master, and yet suffered as if he were not, for perhaps it is true that just because the outcome was unfavorable doesn't mean the decision was flawed. It's not a personal failing that you were unlucky. Ill fortune does not make you more unworthy than you were before. Chance does not place a smear upon your soul. You made the best decision you could with the information you had in such a frame where you were a product of your time, your culture, your mind, your experiences, your perspectives. It is not your fault you were born. And you can still make the right choices just as you are. I will end this on a silly note, with the scenario that got me thinking on all this to begin with. I was playing a video game, an online top-down multiplayer shooter, and my team and the enemy team were neck and neck. The timer ran out, and big bold words flashed across the screen that the team who got the next kill got the win. Me and my team were hiding in an enclosed room, waiting for the enemy to come in and get us for an ambush, but they were sly. They gathered around the door and booted it open, throwing a pile of grenades into the room. In this instant, as I was closest to the door, my mind ran through with a scenario, that if the grenades exploded upon us in this tight, enclosed room, and someone didn't get out of the way fast enough, we would lose. But if I could burst through the door and shoot one of them down before they went off, when they weren't expecting it, I could get one of them before the grenades brought us down and score a win for my team. It is worth noting that I had never played with these gents prior, and so couldn't judge the skill of any, and only had a fraction of a second to run this through my head and decide. I made my choice. I burst out of that room, guns blazing in every direction, probably shouting as much in real life as I was in game, as all my foes were taken aback, either rushing behind cover or trying to shoot me down first. The grenades hit the ground as my team darted every which way they could to try to evade the frames of damage and prayed that their internet wouldn't lag and get them caught in the blast. I shot until my entire clip was empty, and the grenades went off, killing nobody. While I stood outside, in full view of my foes, and got absolutely riddled with bullets. I died, and my team lost. Look, anyone who's ever played a competitive game can tell you just how much I was wrung through the muck in that moment, both by my team and my enemies. It's made all the worse for the fact that I was trying to advise them on tactics throughout the match and got it flung back in my face for not following my own advice, and I tried desperately to explain that just because the outcome was unfavorable didn't mean the decision was flawed, but they just called me a fag and teabagged my corpse. It was horrible. I admit that I left. Not out of anger, but out of shame. That I let my team down. That I was an idiot, a fool, who had made such a terrible decision. But perhaps I didn't. Perhaps there was nothing wrong with my choice inherent. 
Even supposing I didn't act and we all dived out of the way, would they not have just continued to toss grenades in until it got one of us by chance? That supposing I was on a team with men of lesser skill who would have got caught, or supposing their internet skits at that exact moment, or supposing I had the luck to hit someone with low health the moment I burst through the doors, absolutely nobody would be saying I made the wrong choice. Would they? I have made so many wrong choices throughout my life. I have done so many things that blew up in my face or hurt the ones I love, or just make me squirm when I think back on them. The awkward silences and all the attempts that fell flat. It is so easy to just want the earth to swallow us up, to never have to worry about whether or not we'll make those bad choices again. And it is difficult, when we're kept awake in those cold nights, to decide what we could have done better. That there really is anything we could have done better, if the difference between the right and wrong decisions are encompassed solely within the scale of the one who makes them, and the fortune that presides over them. That, maybe, perhaps, we did not make a wrong decision but only made the best decision we could with the information we had. And sometimes in those late nights, when those old memories of missed calls and misjudgments keep us up, perhaps that thought alone can help us sleep. This has been a free audio recording of you made the best decision you could with the information you had. An essay filed and sorted in my anthology titled For Your Consideration. If you enjoyed my writing style and wish to get more of it, then you will be tickled pink to know that you can by purchasing the ebook or paperback version available at the links below, where you will enjoy almost two dozen more essays, including A Plus Business Advice, My Worries Over the AI Apocalypse, and one large collection of jumbled thoughts because I really didn't know what else to include. They're all good thoughts, though, I promise. But if you've already spent your treat money on coffee and avocado toasts, then you can make it up to me by clicking on my channel and giving a big thumbs up and a big fat comment and telling all your friends about me. And you should do all that because I could be literally any cowboy you meet and it's just not worth the risk. Until next time.